let's continue with the fifth mm, uh, version of this forum. The eighth session is politics and agreements in Latin America. Would you please take your seats? To moderate this session, I will give the floor to Monica Gonzalez. Welcome. Good morning, all, and thank you very much. Thank you for still uh, being with us. In this table that undoubtedly is one of the ones that will clearly show with a sense of urgency how important politics is, the importance of having good politicians to have good democracy. After the previous panel, we perfectly know in our continent that most of our countries have been devastated by armed, long-lasting armed conflicts, and there are some other conflicts which are uh, finishing. So I say they are over in words and in some documents because we know peace doesn't come after signing an agreement, and because most of the conflicts have had several reasons. We have a very nice table or session because we have one of the uh, very important first, second, and third line uh, protagonist. Here we have one of the protagonists of the peace process in Colombia, a civil and armed conflict. It has never been a declared civil war, but a conflict that is a war. It has lasted 54 years, and the balance is 5 million victims from 5 to 6. I am speaking about uh, victims who are people who have been moved or displaced, more than 100 families. And there are 222,000 people who have died. And the official uh, numbers do not give us all the background information. So we're speaking about, this is something I never thought was going to happen in Colombia. I never thought I was going to be able to see it. The recovery of lands, because one of the very interesting things is that that process will have an economic component. And there was six million hectares that were uh, uh, taken away from the farmers. And today, they start in, uh, in this delivery process. It is a rebel, terrible conflict that has lasted many, many years, since 1954. And here we have two of the uh, protagonists in these armed conflicts, which is the armed conflict of El Salvador. It has started with the emblematic assassination that we will never forget, the assassination of Arzobispo, uh, Arzo, Bishop Romero in 1980 in the capital city of El Salvador, and it lasted till 1992. That conflict has been terrible. The representative from Salvador, uh, he was speaking about uh, uh, Latin America. Um, once I listen in Havana as a journalist, I have always been a journalist, that Fidel Castro said. It is said that Cubans are the best guerrilla warriors in Latin America, but uh, they are wrong. It is, mm, it is people from El Salvador. So to finish this introduction, I would like to tell you that I hope Participants in this panel will also be speaking about another component that we always uh, omit, the economic component. The people interested in hindering agreements towards peace, 
not only because they do not agree politically, it is because there is a machine of war that is fed, and we should never stop seeing it. Two pieces of information for us to understand. Let's do not forget $6,600 million. This is the yearly revenue of uh, trafficking in persons, which is one of the results of the armed conflicts that we have in Central America. But please pay attention to this. There has been a, a trend towards the South and without even speaking about many more uh, conflicts because of the black uh, trade of arms. And we should not forget that here we are missing one person from Guatemala because fear, four years after the civilian war in Colombia, Guatemala was invaded from Honduras and then freed. Uh, one uh, was the owner of power. Then the massacre of Guatemala hasn't been quantified. And we just uh, were notified, and we saw an internet only a few years ago, but there was n nothing happened that in that invasion, uh, Nazis uh, from the Second World War uh, also participated, sent by, by the United States. I uh, will. Uh, uh, the first speaker, the first panelist, will be presenting the link between the previous uh, panel and this one. Because evidently, as Flavia said, what is the democracy we can speak about in some countries if we vote with the conflict there, with the weapons on the table? Guerrero, for example, after this um, slaughter, but there are many places where this happens. So it is very interesting for the magistrate of this higher court, uh, Fla Flavio Bernal, to please speak about his appreciation, his perspective on quality of democracy in light of uh, armed conflicts like the ones we have seen, the ones we see with all the toll and the balances. Things? I apologize for not being in the previous uh, session, but the agenda in the higher uh, court is not always uh, available to us. Mm. I will try to link quality of democracy with another topic, with preventive effects for us, for Mexico. What have we lived and what are we living in political terms we speak about a democratic system, which is a reason for us to be proud of, uh, to feel proud. We have left, uh, left behind many years of the 20th century, and now it is the 21st century with a better strengthened uh, system after the 90s. But what is the democracy we are speaking about? To me, we should be speaking about a comprehensive economic democracy, social democracy, and political democracy. The fact of going to the uh, booth uh, to cast our vote is not enough. We can speak about a comprehensive democratic system when in Mexico we have, according to the census of 2010, we have 11 and a half million poor people in extreme poverty. And if we speak about 53 million poor people, this can't be a country with comprehensive democracy. What are we missing? We need to go back to the political aspect. We need to be to pay attention to the social process going on through the democratic stage. If democracy is government by the people, for the people, and if it is, if it owns, it is owned by the people, it is the free will of people, the one electing governors, but we need this government to be for the people. So it is a pending point that will uh, bring many problems. We already mentioned Guerrero. We have the problem of Tamaulipas. We have the trouble, the issue in Sinaloa. We have several states in Mexico, 
Unfortunately, we are missing a social pact. We need to make another social pact, a pact for peace before this current peace will spill out or overflow because we don't want to live in a world of violence. We don't want to live in a world of insecurity. I believe that we need to keep on uh, taking the same pathway started by the Republic of Brazil. We should continue with a pathway that uh, no more than 15 years ago, the Republic from Honduras started a clean uh, history background of our candidates. We need to make a pact so that political parties and government and all the different aspects of government will determine as a requirement to be a candidate to prove that people are honest people, those who want to run for candidacy, uh, those who want to be candidates, honesty. It should be one of the characteristics that should be present in all the citizens. But today, it seems to be that without any express um, or official denunciation, now one of the municipal mayors is being investigated, one of the ones of the state of Guerrero, one of the it has been a, been a lack of security. Le it, should, it should never be across the national territory. Let's prevent, let's make th this pact so that we have clean background information, clean candidates. Now that we are starting the electoral process 2014-2015, we can know for sure that congressmen, congresspeople, federal and local ones, we want members of the city halls in every federal entity. We want them to be people who are trustworthy people. We want to be sure that there is going to be peace. There is going to be social peace in the national territory, in each one of the municipalities, in each one of the entities. We need to choose governors for the federal entities. Be careful not allowing money from the organized crime. Now that we will have independent candidates, it will be necessary to establish what is going to be the public financing to make elections competitive and to also have safe elections. Let's do not allow f uh, financing from organized crime in electoral activity because this would be a big problem, the clean history of uh, each one of the candidates. And on the other hand, of course, we need to also prevent Let's do not allow for mandate revoca revocation. As the governor of the state of Guerrero says, I will be subject to a national consultation. And I can be subject to a consultation in my entity to see if I will stay or if I have to go. Part of this social uh, pact towards peace and security should also be the revocation of the mandate, because um, regardless of the reasons. but. One of the reasons for this a lot of the clean background information is a topic of uh, not allowing for corruption. Corruption should never be present. Corruption out, because we don't want to have corruption. We don't want to have crime in electoral activities. And we don't want to have insecurity uh, for the society in the municipality, in the state or in the country. We need to have a pact for social peace, preventive pact for not to make it a corrective one. Interesting, interesting what he just said. Violence, 11 and a half million inhabitants, men, women, children, and that is uh, the issue, that is a problem. So we need to bring a solution to the state of Guerrero. Very interesting. We will now go uh, with our second panelist, who is lawyer, a former candidate for the president's, uh, presidency of Peru. Lourdes Flores, a country that, as we all know as well, 
It was also affected by a long conflict which was the product of the movement Sendero Luminoso. But let's do not forget the mispractice bad democracy applied by governments and by the uh, f uh, fateful Vladimiro Montesino. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be in this event. We're going to be speaking about democracy and dialogue. And I would like to start by saying that we are seeing, we are witnessing the longest democratic cycle without authoritarian interruptions, but with uh, populism weaknesses and the, the negative democracy without enough citizens' awareness. We are living a modernization process, economic modernization process with an emerging middle class and with very important changes, but it is not a completed process. There are some collisions, and I will be relating this to the topic of political dialogue with communities, for example, because at the end of the day, there is a threat a modernization process. And this is uh, something that happens in rural communities. So we need to have democratic plural responses. One direction decisions and this cycle, which is a stable policy, the weakening of this apathy, uh, discredit of politics. And this is something we saw in the previous panel. Dialogue, dialogue is a central element in democracy. In other words, the recovery of electoral democracy, this is very important, the continuity of uh, democratic cycles. This is uh, vital as well, but the living together, the democratic a union to be genuinely democratic, we need to have a specific levels of dialogue, understanding, and negotiation. And this is going to be to set it apart from the authoritarianism. I would like to make reference to some spaces for dialogue, some things that we've seen in Latin America. To me, these are the most important spaces to have quality, to come to quality of democracy. We are not speaking about the existence of democracy, rather the quality. Number one, relationships between public powers. This is a fundamental dialogue space. And we have, for example, the sense of urgency to recover the parliament as a space for a dialogue. Democracies are more for executive uh, powers, different constitutional and real levels of power, uh, very weak ju judicial power mm. that should be a strong judicial branch because this is the one that will exercise control. And uh, it is normally the weakest out of the three branches, but also in general terms in our countries, in most of our countries, the big scenario for the political dialogue that happens to be parliament is worn out, um, big, uh, worn out because of this way of handling politics. So this is one of the most important topics. Recovery of democratic institutionality in a place like parliament, because this mm -hmm. is a natural space for the political dialogue, institutional political dialogue. Dialogue between powers and recovery of the quality of those institutions. A second very important level of dialogue is the dialogue between central governments and subnational governments, where if we see the economic process and the disparity, we are starting to see very severe difficulties and very important difficulties. Uh, great mining potential where there is a huge so a social conflict where the, uh, there is one case of one person who is uh, being accused of corruption, where there is a national political problem. And this person who is being accused of corruption, he has been an advocate. Uh, he just got 50% of the total number of votes in very high criticism uh, situation. So we need to recover these levels of trust. Uh, second, uh, thirdly, dialogue among political parties. To come uh, to be able to have this dialogue in our country, we came to a national agreement and it gave the important opportunity to 
work with the different political parties, dialogue with the community, this plural Latin American community. If a lot of people think it is possible to have communication through unilateral Twitter or communication because it is uh, something deceitful, it is an only one way dialogue, but we are not catching the feeling of people, so we need to have, uh, to, we need to come to this dialogue. There is a real divorce between the official political sphere and the people. And dialogue in Latin America to come out of conflicts. In the case of Peru, Sendero Luminoso was not a process with dialogue. It was a military, successful process. But we also have additional concerns. The pretension to reincorporate the political life through a political party. And it is not the correct way of doing this because there is no genuine democratic commitment. And another concern that I, we need to also address in order to not allow risks in democracy is the risk of unlawful financing in politics. And this is something we are starting to see in institutions. And, it, and this brings difficulties and many risks. So there are some scenarios and venues for dialogue which are vital to recover quality in democracy. And this is the place where I believe there, is, there are many pending tasks. <coughs> now we're going to give the floor to the Colombian lawyer, Antonio Lizarazo. He was the chairman of the National Electoral Board in his country, but he is also an advisor for the high, um, office of the high commissioner in Colombia. And this is a process that brings many expectations. We know how important it is for his country. When we think and when it is said that we need to address more than four points, um, there is going to be a change and obviously we know the hindrances and that this country is facing with white hopping and with this war machine. Thanks. Thanks for this invitation to participate in this event. And after these three days of intense debate on democracy, on the role of the electoral processes, um, speaking about its incidence in the quality of democracy, we will now have the possibility to speak about agreements. And we can speak about the incidence of agreements in the construction of democracy. I will now the terms of reference. And at the end, if we have time, because I will, uh, if I have time, I will make reference to the process we currently face. The first question that we saw, the first question asked is making reference to politics as a consensus and whether or not the result is higher stability, higher quality in the stability in democracy. The consensus should necessarily produce stability. But in political terms, uh, consensus and stability, these two words do not have um, obvious uh, meanings. Consensus in democracy doesn't imply conflict or disagreement. And stability doesn't mean the lack of conflict. Colombia is a good example in history of what has been the meaning of going using war as a political action approach and to constantly uh, use agreements. And um, the use of agreements to resolve the armed confrontations. The conflict, as many theor uh, theoretical people have said, is inherent to the nature of the society. And this is why democracy is justified as a way that would allow us uh, to uh, build the necessary consensus. But for consensus to bring stability, it is necessary. They need to be the product. They need to come from democratic procedures. They should come from those procedures that would allow the participation of all the different players to allow for the expression of all the interests. And in general terms, 
the pluralism that is present in the society. But we also need, and here I would like to call the attention, it has been one of the central points. We need to warranty the exercise of opposition. We need to warranty those who are not part of the majoritarian consensus to exercise opposition, and not only in the exercise of the contradiction, but the warranty that there are adequate procedures so that those who exercise opposition can uh, be the majority, and they can also be part of the majoritarian agreement in the future. And this is one of the fundamental things. And it was precisely the first point addressed uh, with FARC in relationship to point two of the agenda in terms of political participation, the need to warranty the, uh, the guarantee for the opposition. And I would like to call the attention to something we saw in the discussion, something that was present in the discussion, uh, speaking about our historical reality. Warranties cannot only be, or rights cannot be, the protection of life only, or the physical integrity or completeness. It should be the real right uh, to exercise freedoms and political rights for those who are going to join in the political life from the opposition. We want them to be able to um, become the majorities. And this is why, for them to become the majority, and this is why in this process, it is not uh, it is not to come to substantial agreements on the programmatic uh, platform of FARC and the process, the assumption that they have the right to keep on striving for those ideals for which they have been fighting but with arms, but in the future to fight or to defend those same ideas, but through democratic processes. The uh, ultimate goal is not to allow the use of arms and the, the use of violence as a political action approach. And it doesn't imply we want to acquit our ideals. And this is the reason for these confrontations, for this armed confrontation. On that regard, and speaking about the terms of reference that we were given, I, would, I could say that we want, with this uh, process of peace, And speaking about uh, the closer wits, what we want to do, what we want to do is to use politics as a continuation of war, but using different approaches. Now we're going to listen another lawyer. If you see, um, we have. In this type of dialogues, we have many, many lawyers. Uh, he comes from El Salvador, and he was a, a stakeholder, a very important negotiator. He was a minister, and he has always been in the side of the government. And it was an opposed, uh, he was on the other side. He was uh, facing Farabundo Martí. And so we're going to give the floor to Dr. Oscar Santa Maria. To, yes, Oscar Santa Maria. He has many years of experience, and he has classified some of this historical information, because what is important is to, um, take, to know what is the balance after the elections. What is the balance for all people? First of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, all the organizing entities of this forum. I would like to thank INE for inviting us to be present in this panel. Now, we, uh, we already started the discussion of this panel, and this is um, something I also would like to address with uh, those who share this uh, um, session. And in the documentation we were given, politics and agreements in Latin America. We uh, come to this context, and in this context, in an armed situation, in an armed conflict situation that we had a century ago, what lots of people said is that it was the bloodiest uh, armed conflict in South America, the one we had for 12 years. 
uh, where the uh, toll, life toll, uh, from 75,000 to 80,000 people. This gives you the dimension of uh, what uh, our country went through at that time and of the steps the Salvadoran society demanded in order to stop and end this conflict. In this regard, going back to the government, uh, in 1989, the first one was established as uh, the cornerstone for our government and our administration was uh, the conqueror of peace through all the settlements that uh, would have to be installed. We wanted to solve the conflict because uh, we tried to, to really solve the conflict uh, through which it started. There are several reasons for causalities. I stand and I stay to one of them, a political exclusion. Then the war arrived, uh, and uh, trying to give a solution to this, uh, we had to go back to the reasons that uh, make it uh, emanate. And this is uh, the visionary, the transcendental step we had to give. Uh, we had to, to put arms aside to think better that we should have to be included than excluded to listen to us than killing us. And maybe this was the most important part to be able to try to establish that in the case of this conflict of interest, the country was at the head, was our priority, and we needed to sacrifice everything to finalize the conflict, putting the country as uh, the forefront priority. So it was a process where very many wills uh, had uh, to really agree. We needed to look for peace uh, in this clear will of political oppression, expression. Without it, we could not be speaking about looking for peace. And peace is also conquered by means of costs. Of course, of course, uh, War is costly. The most important one is uh, the human sacrifice. Uh, but peace also has its cost. It is uh, the most profound uh, endeavor we have uh, to seek for. And this is why it is my pleasure to be here in Mexico again, because here we had uh, really the central part of all this meeting we had for over 18 months and our permanence in Mexico. Mexico hosted us and two third parts of all these meetings we had were aimed at having peace. So whenever we have said that peace has to be shaped without thinking about any interest and putting our country at the forefront. This is the Murray of El Salvador. There were several wills that really were together. And it is important for us to mention this. We were really backed, very well supported by the international community because we wanted to attain peace. And here we can mention what uh, happened with the Contador group, uh, Stipulas, the United Nations, and what uh, the four country friends of El Salvador contributed with uh, Mexico, El Salvador, Colombia, and Spain, because in this way, we were able to really form part of the international agreement. And with this, uh, we say that uh, out of everything that happened uh, from that time, we were able to really have peace, uh, peace in our new country. And these are the political agreements of Chapultepec, um, really a different range that was fundamental in order to wreck 
the peace of this country, what was called by the UN, the new foundation of uh, the Republic. These are the Salvadoran peace agreements. If the case of El Salvador has become an example, not a model, but an example of what peace is. And uh, as Mr. Kofi Annan said, when we finished with the verification of all this Salvadoran agreement, Salvador is a country, a new society. We are on our way of developing more. The Salvadoran peace agreements really were not uh, really the point of entrance, but uh, the stemming point. Thank you very much. The exit point. Uh, well, on my left side, I have uh, one other uh, attorney in legal sciences. Uh, she is a former commander of the guerrillas, and she was negotiating the Salvadoran peace agreements. Uh, she's a representative, and she's at present uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Farabundo Marti Front, founded by her. Good morning. Thank you very much for having me. In order to tell you about the Salvadoran peace agreement and today because uh, we are celebrating uh, the Farabundo Marti Front and we have been for the last 34 years. In order to understand the present, we need to know where we come from and we have uh, to really forecast the future. El Salvador for very many years had very dark nights of repression, military dictatorships, um, political exclusion, and uh, we were able uh, to create uh, the conditions uh, so that uh, the division of the society could uh, really exploit. Uh, there are two possible ways uh, to solve uh, all these issues, uh, we need the political will, the understanding, or the confrontation. At that time in El Salvador, the dialogue was a tradition, and for instance, um, any peace uh, manager just uh, like uh, Monsignor Romero made the people feel very uncomfortable. They were assassinated in 1979 in Cartel stopped uh, the help uh, to El Salvador. This uh, was reinstalled uh, with Reagan in 1980, and this was unavoidable. Several management uh, procedures uh, were made. The FDRM uh, tried to avoid this, and we were imposed a war we did not want it. And as Oscar said, well, there was a large cost of human lives, the destroyed nature. And if everybody bets on the military solution, everything becomes a swap. This is why we dialogued for eight years and two were negotiations between the 90 and the 92. We had to change uh, this uh, force coalition. We were accompanied uh, by the civil society with solidarity. And we had several managerial procedures. Uh, and the people wanted uh, really desired peace. I was in this dialogue, and people in 1984 really expressed their expectations, and they worked for it. So we are a process of consolidation. Peace is not the absence of arms. It is an integrated concept. It is the harmonization of the political, the social, the civil concepts. Peace is not just to pacify, because uh, in order to have peace, we need to, to make use of political will. But once again, we have a problem if we do not fight against all these causes. And uh, peace agreements uh, had four proposals. Uh, first, uh, to really overcome the armed uh, 
process we had, uh, we needed uh, to get full compliance to human rights in order to make Salvador reconcile 23 years after all these reforms that was translated in 34 articles reformed in the Constitution. All of them are constitutional. A new state of law was opened, and this is the process we have been using. This is intimately related to democracy. Agreements uh, had to really make subservient what was not necessary, the electoral part, really became a jurisdictional entity where all voters were able to know, to get to know the registry. And we also had a moral warrantory stating uh, that uh, the rights of the people will not be trespassed. Uh, so after 18 years uh, of uh, really going through the electoral process, uh, well, in 2009, we had uh, the elections won, uh, and we had the agreement, dialogue, as an experience. And it uh, really helped us uh, to go into profounder reforms. And now we have the citizenry, the control that has to be created by the citizens, because this has really been the construction stone of democracy. So all those processes that are on its way should be accompanied, as we have said, because peace is a process that it has to be accompanied by the international community. And peace is won through political means. Wars are solved with military endeavors, but they cannot solve the large problems that led to this conflict. We have great teachings in Salvador with its very humble experience is at your beck and call. And 23 years after, we can say that El Salvador has been in an irreversible peace process. Uh, we have uh, no problems. Uh, we have been unable uh, to really overcome uh, impunity and uh, very many war crimes that uh, are really humongous. Uh, and uh, we also have uh, this uh, least uh, crimes that are still affecting us. Thank you very much. I am sure that uh, very many of you have thought about this and what Demaras represent. One of the results and disastrous effects that we have had is impunity and violence. And we have to start with this. And this is a good consensus, the one we have here. In order to have peace, we need to improve. And we need to really better the quality of uh, politics. And we have to fight against corruption, impunity, because somebody could say that uh, problems uh, well, are over, the ones that gave rise uh, to armed uh, conflicts. And today, well, the economic power is not interested in all these uh, military coups. And we have uh, to really finish uh, this uh, days uh, with Gustavo Palomares, uh, who will give uh, a very objective and substantial vision of what is uh, going uh, to what is taking place. Well, it's very difficult for me. Monica, thank you very much uh, that in seven minutes uh, I will be able to do so, but I will try to do my best. Uh, I will tell you about our personal and professional experience, because they, this table does reflect my academic, uh, political, and uh, academic 
experience of the last 25 uh, years, uh, we have been joined by the Institute of European Studies. I have headed several of these initiatives. And uh, we see all this overcoming of uh, violent conflicts uh, with uh, different expressions. Uh, we were in Contadora in Esquipulas, Union Brothership, one of the rapporteurs of this uh, minutes uh, of Esquipulas uh, two, where we had uh, the Central American Parliament. Uh, we were also in the changes of dictatorships in the southern Kona. I coordinated uh, Pinochet's uh, plebiscites in uh, 1978 and uh, also in Correa de Paz in 1992 in order to overcome the Salvadoran conflict in 1996 in Guatemala. And at present, uh, we are heading uh, this uh, post-conflict peace agreement. So, well, I will give you four or five traits that have to do with each process. They are very unique. They cannot be applied to realities, but there are some mistakes that have been made and do deserve some type of uh, pondering in order to really exit violence in Colombia. We should not make the, ma the same mistakes. Uh, so in a very schematic way, I'd like to tell you what my experiences have been. The first one has to do with um, how this negotiation uh, process uh, has uh, to be destroyed. We have to preserve uh, the improvements of the negotiation. And the method uh, where we are at in Colombia, well, we see that the presidency of the republic and that the FARC uh, have uh, decided to update uh, the agreements made in this negotiation process. This has to do with what uh, Robert Dahl called the institutionalization of agreements. It's not a negotiation among the actors uh, of uh, the agreement, but actually a social provision that uh, will allow the legitimacy process uh, to become uh, one of the most important elements, and not as an agreement in itself, uh, but rather as a transformation element uh, that will allow society to perceive this as indispensable. This is uh, really very serious uh, because uh, there is a time uh, when we see that this becomes infectious, and there is also that there is also an opposition uh, syndrome that will allow this to either happen or not. Uh, we were speaking about forex, uh, the positive forex, and we saw that uh, the main objective of this uh, is not agreement, uh, but uh, rather to create uh, not uh, only the suppression of violence, uh, but also the reasons that give rise to it. So the essential part is not just uh, to subscribe an agreement, but actually to have this implemented. But the most uh, difficult part uh, is to comply uh, with them. And uh, this agreement uh, will really stop uh, violence, uh, definitely. The third uh, part, part uh, is that uh, the suppression of violence uh, will not be only applied in large cities, uh, but um, in those spaces uh, where these conflicts uh, have uh, become uh, more infections, rural areas or municipalities our departments. Therefore, we need to really strengthen the weakest uh, links uh, so that uh, these peace agreements will become really a transformation and a further improvement in territories. Um, of course, uh, this will have to be administered and will have uh, to apply peace agreements. I would like to make reference uh, to, three, to three shortcomings uh, which are fundamental in all these uh, agreement processes to suppress violence. First, the historical, the historical one that is uh, in our DNA. I speak about all of us uh, because of this shortcoming uh, that uh, 
is uh, really supposing the lack of uh, citizenry, the lack of uh, civil rights, uh, the lack uh, of uh, this um, moral acts uh, that uh, really make us uh, become uh, the leading actor. This is the DNA of the Spaniards uh, and of the colonial heritage you have. It is fundamental for us to find a new social pet which will allow us not to live the deaths, the dramas, the genocide we have lived in this continent as if it were a usual breakfast, a usual democracy that allow us to digest the assassination of 43 students in a, a very impaired way. For this, uh, I say that we need to see all the figures uh, given to us uh, by the human content report. Uh, there are five Latin American countries uh, that uh, are really the leading ones in terms of violence. Uh, five Latin American countries. I will, I will stop. I will finish. And not to speak about the conflicts uh, we have had to manage pedagogy. Peace pedagogy is a fundamental challenge we have uh, to really build uh, in our schools. Uh, peace chairs uh, that uh, will really make us better in the short, uh, mid, and long runs in the 15 or 20 next year. And I would like to speak about uh, this political shortcomings. Peace agreements have uh, to be a fundamental transformation political excuse uh, that will make them uh, become an instrument that will fight against inequality in order to look uh, for fairer societies that will have a uh, more equity, equality, peace agreements and their implementation need to become a transforming element. Please, uh, Colombia, be very attentive. Social transformation so that this population that will have uh, to live through them, manage them, uh, will not uh, give uh, this conclusion in El Gato Pardo by Osir Pollution. Let's change everything to make everything uh, remain the same. We need to devise a new status quo, quo that will fight against the violence that has been experienced by our society. Thank you very much. Well, it has not uh, been said in this uh, way, but since I am a journalist, I think we have uh, to put it this way. We need uh, to make a consensus. We have to say consensus when there is a consensus, corruption when there is corruption. And uh, there will not be peace if we do not offer a real solution. Next, we will go to the question and, and answer period. I'm sorry, we have just three minutes. And there is a collective reflection. How can we speak about quality? Democracy, if there is an assumption that uh, is uh, really casting tears and blood. I think that uh, this uh, reflection is very interesting. Uh, and uh, this also is also addressed to the panel. What's your perspective in order to un subscribe a regional agreement based upon public policies uh, for 2015? This is kind of uh, opaque. We need to give a very clear response to the panel. After several conflicts uh, before dictatorial regimes, uh, what can be done uh, in terms of just uh, not taking into account uh, drug trafficking? And to the full panel, present democracy allow allows for a genuine response and uh, does it really allow th for this uh, to all the elements of society trying to solve uh, 
specific conflicts uh, or do we need uh, to really make use of demonstrations uh, in order to really express uh, our needs to the government? So why don't we have a political will? And uh, this is uh, d addressed uh, to Magistrate Galvan. Do you think that the mandate uh, revocation is uh, the most appropriate way to separate somebody from the tenure he has? Uh, all this uh, is uh, clear or really ambiguous. What can you say in this regard? And for lawyers after the Peruvian elections, how do you envision the political map? Do you act with a mea culpa attitude? And why do leaders like Jose Castro, Villanueva, and some others have really removed the weight your party head uh, for Gustavo Antonio, how can you construct credibility in a dialogue process uh, where everything is that polarized? How can you assign rights if dialogue per se is the denial of uh, tenures and interest? And uh, finally, Miriam. What is your life evaluation? I love this question. Have all these years of anguish really proven to be worthwhile in the field of the assembly? Can you tell me a little bit more about this? And now I will give the floor to the magistrate. Thank you very much, Monica. Well, rather than a question, or rather than several questions, I find several reflections. And in my opinion, we should start with a recurring subject in terms of reflections and proposals, education, namely. If we do not effectually, effectively educate people in the realm of peace, if we do not educate people being supported by principles and values in children, maybe we will never be able to solve problems. Could you please, could you please answer the question, Magistrate, because we only have uh, two minutes. I will not exceed my, my time because this is the fundamental topic, education, in my opinion, and the condition that we public officials are here to serve, that we are not uh, having the tenure of public power, but actually we have to serve the population, mandate revocation. We do not have such a system. And in addition, it must be thoroughsome. We do not need only to separate the public tenure, but also we have to take into account the civil and uh, the criminal positions. Maybe we need to speak about confiscation, all those things uh, that uh, really remove uh, the power from those people who have not uh, really behaved uh, properly. This is a mandate uh, revocation. Thank you very much. Well, your answer is terrible. Thank you, Lourdes. Well, I want to tackle one of the general questions and uh, one other one that has to do internally with the party, the general question, dialogue, civil and military. I think uh, this does not only speak about uh, authoritarianism, but actually about the professionalism uh, that is aimed at rejecting all these uh, threats. Uh, for instance, uh, drug trafficking, illegal powers, and this needs uh, really a lot of civility and military professionalism. Uh, committed within the fields of democracy. I think there is a great challenge, and the problem is the opportunity. I don't know to know if somebody inside my party has uh, posed this question. I belong to a political party that forms a part that has been in, pre in 
existence for the last 50 years. We're speaking about this Peruvian region. So this is uh, why the central dialogue uh, takes place. Uh, we see what uh, happens, and we see that uh, there is a large uh, fragmentation of independent uh, local movements. So this is not the scenario, the best one to consolidate uh, democracy. I need that in El Salvador. We need more democracies in order to make this more formal. However, this is also how to really make us uh, be aware of what is uh, taking place in the inside of the country and what is the national vision we have to have. Uh, well, if a political party has uh, internal pressures, uh, this will be overcome. And I can really tell you that in spite uh, we have not really attained power, we have a permanent vocation and we need to have a self-criticism and we have to have an internal dialogue because this is the democratic mechanism. But the important message for Peru is that we need to, to deeply strengthen the formal policy, the electoral policy, and it has to be strengthened in a more formal and institutional way. We still have a very important pending matter to attain. Antonio, in your countries you have everything, drug trafficking, paramilitary people, you have corruption, and I am not, um, uh, it is not pejorative. It is exactly the other way around, and you know it, because you have a huge challenge. Yes, it is a, big, a very big uh, challenge, and the specific question refers to how how are we going to achieve, how are we going to, uh, how are we going to succeed in this paralyzation? Not only in the political paralyzation, but uh, what we see in the surveys, almost all the surveys show that uh, around 60 or 70 percent of Colombian people they want to come to peace, but at the same time, at the same time, they are not willing, and they don't want to have politi political participation of the armed players in the democratic life. So the trend um, to ask. Uh, for pen, uh, penalization and responsibilities and liability for the damage. And apart from this, there is even bigger complexity. If we remember that we have all the deficits uh, that Gustavo Palomares has uh, spoken about, we are lacking uh, tolerance, respect, no stigmatization, tolerance. Um, to contradiction and to the diverse uh, thinking. Um, consequently, we need, or the biggest challenge, the biggest challenge of this process is to have agreements, to come to agreements. And we want them to convince Colombians that that is the best alternative. And as Gustavo said, it is a big opportunity for big transformations with a territorial approach as well, because it is agreements that imply transformations in those territories that have been affected by the conflict. In fact, the points that we have agreed upon emphasize this territorial approach, the application of uh, the subject of agreement, but here we should all do what we need to do, and in this process, we permanently look for um, ways to face those challenges. It is not easy. It is pretty complex. It is not easy. The, the presidential uh, elections, we uh, showed that huge uh, division there is in light of the agreements. But it is good to say that there is no paralyzation between yes or no in p agreements for peace. It is rather the content and the things we need to come to. Having in mind the problem of justice.
in your country nowadays violence prevails. In the past, uh, there was a civil war, but today people are pretty afraid of uh, dying in the hands of guns. And young people are violent because they have no expectations. The, uh, the, uh, the pathway from the end of the civil war to today has been pretty problematic. What is your light, your answer to, to this? I believe in El Salvador, yes, it is true, there is a transition from war to peace, from peace to democracy. We are in transition. I believe the country is a country in transition. We have not come to the what uh, we uh, saw in Chapultepec, but Chapultepec is the main point of reference in the institutional and political life of the country. See how important this is. 23 years later, there is no sign of a political violence. There is not even one. There is not even one. For you to realize, you can tell what is how peaceful we try to be. Uh, from crime, and those um, were uh, once the conflict was over. So we have the challenge of giving the opportunity to the Salvadorian society to build that peace in a harmonic living together that we all wish. But yes, as Gustavo said, th many things to be resolved. But I believe that if we are in conditions to sit down if we have the possibility to rescue the spirit of Chapultepec, to look af uh, to go after this consensus that the country needs in El Salvador, we have said uh, it is good to it is necessary to have second generation agreements. We have uh, spoken about the need for a country agenda. We need to have the minimum agenda, not what we used to have in Chapultepec. A minimum agenda is very important, and we have taken uh, steps. Our friends from OIA, uh, no, from the Organization of American States. So this is part of the solution to this dramatic moment that we live in our Salvador society. I have always believed, and I am pretty optimistic, the Salvadorian uh, people have always been in solidarity in difficult moments, and I think we can do it again. The question you were asked is related to this. The worst is to uh, overcome the fear to peace, because then we will get used to violence. We will get used to death. And I am sure in a few more years, some of your children will ask, Mom, Dad, what did you do when the 43 students were killed? This is why it is very important to understand what is happening to us. As I said, agreements for peace were essentially political. They had a constitutional rank, but we also had a component agreement because peace is comprehensive. And one of the causes is not only the political exclusion, but also the economic exclusion. 20 years, 20 years, 18 years, two processes. The process of democratization of the country that then gave rise to political inclusion to many of us. Obviously, the front became a political party, eight electoral processes. This is what we're going to have next year. Mayors, five presidential processes. Today, we are the political party in uh, power, but it is not the whole meaning of democracy. We do not have consultation. We have many more things, but we do have the base, because changes are a process of several generations. And what we did with all these agreements for peace is not to resolve uh, revolutionary programs. We wanted to do that. But democra democracy should give you the tools to continue with the fight. The economic component was another process.
people, poor people became even poorer. What we've seen in the last five or six years is this social inclusion process, stronger than in the past. And now we want to come to economic reactivation, but we are also in a process of consultation. We started a dialogue. Despite of the electoral pre-campaign, we have the organization of United Nations the Organization of American States, the National Dialogue. I come from the National Board of uh, Citizen Security, where we include uh, churches, political parties, entrepreneurs, etc., etc., for the public policy promoted by the government to be effective. Not only the one by the government, by the state, because um, security problems are comprehensive and they include many factors. And this is a process. And as I already told you, we have the Citizens Participation Office, Transparency Office. This is the first time that we have this moment of all this transparency. Today, you come into internet, you can see the budgets, how the budget is spent. And the, the, now we are going through the judicialization process. We are living a new uh, time, but we have many problems. The problem of crime has a logic to help people, but there is another logic. Organized crime, drug trafficking, and in Guatemala and in Honduras, these are the backyards. These are two logics that oppose. But I'm sure peace is going to win. Since I was 13, I made a commitment to come to changes for, uh, first, political, pastoral, and I made my commitment uh, during the 70s in the revolutionary process. Um, through all these stages, I've gone through all the different situations you can face. I was injured and arrested, I have a testimony, not arrested, I was captured. My um, family w was taken to exile. My husband is, is, was missing. I have been a congressperson since 1994 in the Legislative Assembly in the Central American Parliament, and I was a runner candidate for vice presidency in 1994. I was attacked twice. And then I was crying because, and then I asked myself, what is coming next? But no, there were many other factors that uh, made complicated that process. And with political will, we saw very important changes that have immature the country. When I saw Sanchez sit in, then in June the second, and when and when the military people stopped them. It was a culmination. It was a maturity of people institutionally and politically. When we see in consultation sessions, political parties in government, ARENA, and they still have proposals. In Congress, we debate. But if you have the capacity to consultate, we have many positive aspects to keep on making progress. And of course, there are difficult moments in economy, but there we are. In the insertion process of those who uh, fight self or auto destruction of arms and then transforming them because you think the process of guarantee started but we should also disassemble all the military structures. And the state is responsible for human rights, and for humanitarian rights, and many other things. And this is why there are different conditions. But we should never evade the responsibility of the state and abuse of power. And if we have a guerrilla. And if we have the institutional life, then we do, do we need to do necessary trimming to disassemble the structures that were created for a war. 
we need to do all the paramilitary organizations. Thank you very much. This is dismantle the water machine. It is a titanic, a giant uh, task that where we should all, all participate. Thank you very much. And it is another important component is not to feel creative because in your um, I didn't I was not able to feel that. So, so you didn't express this hatred. I would like to uh, speak about the 2015 because uh, yes, there is a relationship in the question asked by our um, peer in the auditorium with those fundamental aspects, not only to speak about culture, um, but speaking about social conflicts, I remember, I would like to remind you all that we are about to start 2015 with a collective effort and we need to meet the objectives of the millennium, and those objectives are closely related to those ca to those causes that will promote, facilitate, be. Uh, culture broth. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to make a balance and tell at what extent, internationally, regionally, at what extent we've made progress. As of this uh, 2015, how are we going to understand two societies that have historically uh, opposed? And I will be speaking about the 50 years uh, but I would like to tell you how it has been in the case of the Spanish um, society. How can we find this formula for understanding? I would say that oh, that equation can be resolved. R remembering the historical memory, the historical memory that is not of the ones who have won and the ones who have lost because we never win or lose the wars. We suffer the wars. So our children, our grandchildren will have to study in their textbooks a historical memory that is going to be the result of the social context, not of the uh, conflict. They should be a fruit of this agreement. So I would say it is fundamental those elements, those topics we always speak about. It is necessary to know the truth, knowing the truth. And this is something that belongs to all of us, what the different players have done, what has been the fundamental element, not only the armed elements, but the historical um, responsibility of the state, the responsibility of the different governments. And this is a very important element, justice, it is fundamental to have a balanced uh, frame where we can apply exceptional justice to overcome the conflict. But this will not take us to impunity. There's going to be no uh, heart. There's going to be no peace in the heart of victims if we fall in these elements of impunity. It is not possible to have these uh, lesser crimes, less um, the crime of insulting. In the frame of peace, we can make some of the big mistakes we have made in the past, and let's do not fall into that situation again. Repair, it is fundamental for victims to be in the center of this collective effort. Not today, but the negotiation. Not after, but the application of agreements, but this historical element where the repair for victims is not only administrative repair, which is not enough, or economic, because I am sure we will not have the money and the money to give economic compensation, but rather the moral compensation or repair. It is not <laughs> possible to live as we lived in Spain after 55 years and after conservative governments after two socialist governments, the families of our civil war, they cannot yet take the, the remains of those uh, family members which are in the mm, road system. So ours is a historical, should be a historical repair. This is the only way uh, to come 
for not to have this uh, slaughter, then they sign an agreement, and this is what they call a peace if victims uh, perceive those agreements are the product of a slaughter, but they have not cured the pain of their hearts. And from there to continue with her forgiveness, it is going to be a failed uh, effort. To end, uh, we should say that good politics show that we are not we are not a people counting the number of people who have died. What we only do is to look for our people, to uh, then be able to bury them as they deserve. So we don't we don't want them to be killed. And there is good politics because we don't want our people to be killed, to be murdered. Could you please stay in the room because we will now uh, go to our closing ceremony.
Could you please take your seats? Uh, have your seats because we're about to um, start our closing ceremony. Could you please have your seats? Thank you very much. We're going to start our closing ceremony. Thanks. Good afternoon. We are about to finish this fifth forum on Latin, uh, Latin American democracy. The one that we have organized jointly, uh, the Organization of American States, the, uh, the um, Idea International, Electoral Tribunal Court, Colegio de Mexico, and the IFE, uh, today National Electoral Institute. We've been here three days to speak about governance of democracy, economy, citizenship, and politics. We believe these are only some of the sessions we have had, thanks to all the students, academicians, public officials, media, for being with us. In this closing ceremony, we will have the Secretary of Foreign Affairs, Jose Antonio Mir, Curibeña. We have Emmanuel Ordorica, General Secretary of Colegio de Mexico. Magistrate Alejandro Luna Ramos, President of the Electoral Court. Um, Jose Miguel Insulza, General Secretary of the Organization of American States. Raul Avila, Consultant and Representative of IDEA International in Mexico. And the Chairman, President of INE. Dr. Lorenzo Cordova. 
We're going to start this short ceremony, and we will first give the floor to Dr. Ordorica. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to you all. Dr. Jose Antonio Mead Curibreña, Secretary of Foreign Affairs, uh, Miguel Isunza, Jose Miguel Isunza of the OAS, um, Jose Alejandro Luna, Magistrate President of the Federal Electoral Power, Raul Avila, Consultant of IDEA International. I cordially greet uh, all of you and the people who are watching it uh, through the internet. Uh, we have been uh, gathered here at the fifth uh, International Democracy Forum. We have worked very intensely for five years and we have been able to ponder up on different things and what really concerns us in Latin America. For Colegio de Mexico, it is a great satisfaction to have been the venue for the third time of this forum. In addition, that the stretching of this meeting really agreed with the 75th anniversary of Colegio de Mexico, as it was stated by Mr. Garcia. Garcia Diego. We had uh, the following agenda. We were able to see all the challenges of democracy in Latin America. This is an anniversary celebrated with a great discussion and a critical and constructive analysis. Democracy is a dream that I have um, moved humanity, and nowadays we are really striving to make an analysis on the challenges and democratic perspectives. So we are very happy because clearly we have complied with the commitments and goals that we set for it. when starting this as a reflection scenario, we were able to develop a dialogue among the different political, academic actors, specialized public opinion, and the electoral world in general. Plurality was a great success of reflections, always led to the democratic Latin American strengthening. <coughs> My training, my education is in the med field, and I have had the opportunity of contributing an electoral geography projects and actually math at uh, are at its best. We have been able to evaluate the registration, the electoral one, and we have been able to really go into math and democracy. These methods have allowed us to look for schemes that, that will be fair in order for us to be more equitable in general. The new methods and the technological resources are really make uh, a vehicle in order to develop more equitable societies for us at Colegio. It's been a pleasure to have hosted all of you. I thank all the attendees and co-organizers because they made this forum possible. It is an honor to participate in the spreading out of solutions and the discussion of problems that really afflict both Mexico and the region. It has been a pleasure to share the efforts of Manuel Carrillo and his group of colleagues and collaborators who have always been very prof professional and perfectionist. I want to also thank my colleagues of Colegio de Mexico who were with the organization committee. Well, Dr. Javier Garcia Diego, president of Colegio, sends uh, you his nicest uh, regards uh, because he's a uh, now giving a cheer. I wish those who are coming back uh, a very nice trip back, and I hope you have been comfortable at your home for this last three days. Thank you very much, Dr. Ordorica, for his uh, gentle speech. Next, uh, Magistrate Luna Ramos has the floor. Dr. Jose Antonio Mitt Curibreña, 
Secretary of uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, Dr. Roberto Cordova Villanelo, consultant of the Electoral Tribunal. Dr. Jose Miguel Insulza, Secretary General of the OAS. Professor Raul Avila, consultant of IDEA International. Dr. Manuel Ordorica, Secretary General of Colmex. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon to you all. My appreciation to former councilmen, former president, and to my colleague Salvador. Since last Wednesday, we have been participating in a very interesting democratic meeting, the 50th Forum on Latin American Democracy, Governance of uh, democracy, citizenship, economics, and politics. During this cycle, important personalities of all the governmental and society branches, civil society coming from Mexico, Latin America, and some other invited countries uh, told us uh, about a very interesting uh, reflections on different subjects uh, related uh, to how to implement uh, democracy in our hemisphere. With great pleasure, all of the participants were able to prove that Democracy is a long established uh, regime in our continent. And as an idea, it does form part in a more profound way of uh, the train of thought citizens uh, have. And this really proves uh, the words uh, addressed to us by former president of Uruguay, Julio Maria Sentinet. Latin America has been the daughter of an idea. And uh, this idea is still the heart of its future vision, to build a society, a democratic society. The participations uh, and uh, the presentations uh, made at this uh, colloquium uh, really evaluate Latin American democracy from a viewpoint uh, that really transcends uh, electoral concepts uh, and uh, really does point at the substantial participation of citizens in public matters and in the defense of its rights. In an authentic, in a genuine democracy, said participation must be supported on equality. This is why the protection that has to be given to these groups that have been excluded or minority groups, for instance, women and Indians, has uh, really been part of the electoral agenda of the judicial branch of the Federation for the last 10 years. Uh, to the least, since uh, it is uh, a way of having a dynamic organization, all democratic regime demands that public authorities uh, should work efficiently because they are the ones that implement. One of the fundamental elements of democracy, contemporary re democracy, namely, is electoral justice. This is why we tackled 
the subject on judicialization of uh, this uh, policy since uh, it uh, would, would represent uh, the maturity we should all have. This represents an independent guarantee, an impartial guarantee of all the environments uh, or all the renovation processes of public uh, powers are implemented as well as uh, the implementation of political and electoral rights of citizens uh, are installed. Today's forum ends complying fully with uh, the purpose it had uh, because it, this gave uh, room to reflection, ideas, and the transmission of thoughts vis-a-vis -vis the challenges the consolidation of democracy has in our continent. Lessons that have been taught to us by the speakers and panelists really enriched to a vast length our perspective on the operation of governmental systems in our hemisphere. This is why we want to be very appreciative because of your comments and the way you really told us about them, ladies and gentlemen. The re regime of respect and liberties is what we crave for as a society. This is why it becomes necessary to strengthen the social processes that lead to its consolidation as well as the institutions that are in control of preserving them. Under this premise, the electoral tribunal of the Federation was giving uh, new commitments uh, that are just to be deployed uh, since uh, today in the morning. The new regional room specialized, uh, competent one, was installed in order to know the final resolution of special procedures uh, aimed at sanctioning uh, all this. They have uh, the purpose of guaranteeing the leveling of uh, all the participants involved in all struggles. Uh, the Federal Council has started, and in this regard, uh, the forum ending today was, uh, the, was very timely because it has really been warn us about uh, the dimension and the path uh, we still have to trek in the field of Latin American democracies uh, so as to comply with our real destination, the well-being of human beings. In this uh, project, uh, the institutions, the regional ones uh, who have shared uh, here, really sure this commitment uh, to give the final leap uh, that is really identified uh, with uh, the most effective uh, citizen participation in public decisions as well as to construct uh, equality and prosperity environments for all the population. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Magistrate Luna Ramos. Now we'll give the floor to the Secretary General of OAS, Jose Miguel Insulza. Good afternoon, my fellow country friend, the Secretary of Foreign Affairs, and um, President of Colmex and representatives of IDEA International, Mr. Magistrate of the Judicial Branch of the Federation. I would only like to say some uh, words at this closing ceremony. First and foremost, to, to 
express my deepest uh, appreciation uh, to INI and all the organizers of this meeting. Actually, this is the fifth uh, forum where I am a present. And uh, this uh, is uh, something that has already been established. I think that we really look forward for this democracy forum because uh, it is uh, a permanent uh, meeting we always want to take part in it is a great idea and i want to remind my friend to remember dante caputo who was the leader of this organization and well at that time they they created they devised the space and it still exist so thanks again for this opportunity and uh, well i hope that next year i will attend this meeting get better with a different tenure my appreciation to the people from ifain calmex at its venue and uh, the judicial branch of the federation and idea international that has been with us uh, the fondo de cultura económica we want to express our deepest appreciation to all of them uh, well actually we were wondering about the state of democracy in latin america and we saw that we had to stress the fundamental concept that really changes uh, some terms for instance the democracy of citizens but finally we need to understand that democracy can only be understood if uh, the citizen not the governor because the governor is in any political system uh, and uh, <coughs> democracy does not uh, have uh, to do with governors, uh, but uh, with the citizens. And I think uh, that uh, this uh, really has to do with the real sense of democracy, because we are not speaking about the agent or the attorney. We are speaking about uh, the citizens, and we are just including uh, all these concepts. Then we had a, a seminar. Well, we still have a problem. We have the problem of money, money, politics, and power. A lot has been said in this regard about uh, financing, funding, and the way different sectors view this, because uh, sometimes uh, we see that uh, this is not always transparent uh, for the influence of money, not only on the electoral part, but on our daily chores is still a problem uh, for us. But we have also seen this, uh, and uh, this uh, was uh, broadly discussed uh, yesterday in some uh, panels. How representative uh, are this uh, ideas or concepts, uh, there is, of course, a kind of a distance uh, between the world uh, where decisions are made uh, for very common citizens uh, and to the world of modern technologies uh, that have not been really satisfied uh, by modern technologies. For instance, Twitter, Facebook, and sometimes it is felt that this gap might be closed, but actually it has not been. We have uh, included uh, some other topics, uh, for instance, minorities and women's matters. Uh, now I recall Emily Moreno and some others. Uh, so this gender matters, this gender issues, uh, and the ones uh, that are related to minorities because they are very interesting. Now I think that in this meeting, the topic was uh, can we govern our democracies well actually in terms of what has happened and of course we have uh, really been hit very hard but what has happened because uh, well some time ago we said at least uh, one government collapsed once a year this does not take place any longer now there are 
kinds of responses, but the point is what results do we have? And this goes back and leads us back to democracy. So what results are given by this government? Because let's be honest, um, citizens uh, do not want democracy just uh, because of the value per se they really want democracy because they want that it uh, can give them uh, better than any types of government the solution to the problems uh, but actually this is not a matter of principles uh, but a matter of uh, very precise uh, results so it is indispensable that, uh, and we have discussed uh, this, uh, as to up to what extent uh, democracy solving the problems the uh, humanity of our hemisphere has, uh, because with all the improvements, all the progress made, all the, all the technology, IT, all the proclamation of democracy, well, really human beings uh, still are faced uh, by problems they have never resolved. Well, first of all, the poverty of about one billion people who are under strong famine, and we have a large amount of uh, people of inhabitants uh, in the Americas, and there is a large inequality. <clears throat> Next, uh, human beings have not, or we have not uh, allowed human beings uh, to stop killing each other. We have not been able to suppress violence. And third, we are still in a very enthused race uh, in destroying our environment and the world, the planet we live in. I think that the response we have to democracy is as follows, does it work? Will it result? And we still have a very ambiguous uh, answers. Uh, we will have stable answers when we will say, yes, OK, we have less uh, assassinations. We have less pores now than before. Life uh, is uh, more even for all the inhabitants of our planet. So we are not destroying that much our planet. We have less pollution. We have less climate problems. And therefore, we have made of our world something better. This is a great challenge of democracy. We will come on a yearly basis because we think that this is the instrument with all its flaws, a journal set that uh, is the least uh, danger dangerous uh, this is the instrument aimed at solving the problem but let's not forget that our citizens both uh, males and females uh, want to see results that their democracy works that your families have a better standard of life thank you very much for this opportunity and i wish you uh, great uh, for um, next year and uh, the years to come. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Now, Dr. Lorenzo Cordova, president of uh, INE, has the floor. Thank you very much, Manuel. Dr. Jose Antonio Cid, Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs. Magistrate Luna. Ramos, uh, President of Judicial Branch of the Scourge of the Federation, Dr. Jose Miguel Insulza, Secretary General of the OAS, Permanent uh, Invitee of the Fora and of the um, uh, Fora to come. He has been a distinguished uh, visitor and a permanent invitee at this Fora. And of course, uh, Manuel Ordorica, Secretary General of Colmex, uh, Raul Avila, consultant of IDEA International, and one of the cornerstones of this uh, forum and the previous one. Well, ladies and gentlemen, electoral 
officials, uh, academicians, uh, dear colleagues. Thank you very much for being uh, with us at this closing ceremony. Well, one thing we have uh, for sure, uh, the construction and interconnections on politics, economy, and democracy in each one of the trainers of that uh, were enriched with the participants. Uh, we have been given brand new novelties in order to better understand the challenges faced by our democratic mechanisms. We were not the exceptions. We were able to ratify that in spite of democracy is a national creation which is expressed through its democratic political institutions. Its strengthening becomes more dynamic through the experiences created by means of uh, this uh, international co cooperation. We have seen that this implies equality and to be impartial in its procedure. But if we do not have gender parity, well, we will not have equality. It was stated that uh, to have equality between uh, the genders is imperative uh, because in this way we will be able to go beyond uh, political forces and uh, will be made feasible in the short and uh, run, long run. We were reminded that clientelism was a perverse practice uh, but deeply rooted in our societies uh, because it brings a symmetry and uh, it is essentially a product of two factors. On the one hand, the state and government's inefficiency in order to take care of the population's needs and on the other of uh, the newborn uh, citizenry we have to have. This is why sometimes citizens and organized uh, crime really respond uh, to clientelism. And this is why it is very dangerous. Uh, now, between uh, democracy, equality, clientelism, uh, and political decision, we have a common denominator. Uh, this is uh, citizens. Uh, who are just about to be born, and they should not really be an obstacle, but rather a cornerstone of public policies, or real estate pub policies in terms of civil education that will promote a cultural change. A real and, uh, well, I get uh, really use this term, uh, real cultural revolution, uh, but uh, devised uh, according to what democracy is. Uh, just uh, by means of this profound cultural change, we will really allow political parties uh, and uh, candidates uh, not to go to some other procedures. In spite of that, we know that uh, this is the cat and mouse uh, trap. And second, uh, to really accept uh, defeat uh, as uh, this uh, democratic uh, recreation and uh, that uh, women should really be reinserted in this social field and for it uh, to really fly away from clientelism uh, and uh, really tenure holders uh, should uh, really exert um, their political privileges. I am positive, I am convinced that uh, if uh, citizens do not exert uh, the rights they have, democracy will not be consolidated. It is time that both legislators and governance should know that uh, there must be the device of public policies. Undoubtedly, out of this forum, uh, we will take our own ideas in order to really adapt them to our political processes. But I think that the empirical richness will allow us uh, to really reaffirm that uh, this uh, fifth uh, forum on Latin American democracy was a great success, maybe one of the most important um, conclusions uh, is uh, that uh, this will allow democratic systems uh, to be strong, rigoristic, uh, but allowing structural systems uh, to form uh, a 
different perspective from the electoral one. However, of course, uh, they have an impact uh, on electoral processes, uh, but uh, if uh, really at its main roots uh, they need to do something else, uh, some other types of procedures must be implemented. And I'm speaking about electoral reforms. So we should really step down uh, from this will and to try not to think that this will be really misfortune. If we see how this uh, will guarantee <coughs> all these procedures, we know that uh, we need to have an actor that by definition must be inclusive. And I think that uh, in modern societies, uh, this is the only one. In other words, uh, we need to, to reevaluate the state to consolidate democracy, to reevaluate and strengthen democracy. This implies uh, to really remove the structural problems uh, because they have an impact on the population. And what has happened in this forum really proves uh, to let us be knowledgeable about this because we need to implement uh, long-term policies. Uh, this is not a privilege, nor either to create colonialism, but actually to develop a cohesive social agreement so as to strengthen the very many times eroded social with so as to have a peaceful living together. We need to recognize that we are the most unequal continent all over the world. We have not solved the redistribution problem, and public policies are still waiting. Well, at this closing uh, ceremony, I think that uh, in this and in the four preceding, these spaces have really become a kind of laboratory to really state uh, specific solutions aimed at contributing the democratic rules of this game. In virtue of the above mentioned, we need to strengthen the democracies of our country, of our continent. And uh, I would like to thank uh, for the ninth uh, time in the generosity of uh, the entities uh, that uh, organized this uh, meeting, uh, the OAS, Fondo de Cultura Económica, IDEA International, OAS, COLMEX, but also the speakers and panelists, academicians, students, as well as officials um, of electoral entities. Uh, thank you all. Thank you very much for these three year days <coughs> of intense participation. Well, as I've told you at the beginning of this forum, and as Alejandro recalled, this takes place at the beginning of the federal electoral process of next year. And the one which was started last Tuesday has been enriched because of the reflections made here, because they really, really become a promising intellectual future, both for political parties, some other political actors, candidates, so that uh, in the campaigns that will start soon, they will become nourished uh, by the reflections stated here. This electoral process uh, does not start off, uh, and the people who come uh, from uh, the outside uh, can give uh, proof to this. Uh, the shadow of insecurity as one of the most important structural problems that gravitates uh, on our society has been present. Uh, this is why I think this is a very important space and the election campaigns uh, should also be so that we will be able to Ambition, a way of restating uh, institutions uh, and to tell them about peaceful ways we need to, to process our own differences. Sometimes very profound that characterize our complex societies 
through the recreation of the dem democratic game. In other words, the peaceful path. And I want to say that democracy is not the absence of conflicts. Uh, no, but actually the existence of institutional causes that will reshape our institutional differences. And hopefully institutions which are just starting up will become a space through which the Mexican society will say, as it happened 20 years ago, in spite that violence was different at that time, to say no to violence, yes to democracy. Let's uh, build all these uh, interpretation approaches, creating a new democracy so as to share them in the next uh, sixth uh, forum on democracy. And of course, uh, you are all gratefully invited. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Cordova, for your address. And next, we'll give the floor to the Minister of Foreign Affairs in order for him to make the closing statement at this fifth forum on democracy. Thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity you have given me to share this forum with Manuel Ordorica because it has led us to really reflect if it is really a democracy democracy to hold uh, three out of five uh, meetings on democracy or not and uh, give uh, really the venue to different institutions. Well, of course, uh, I need to really recognize the architect uh, who has uh, really shaped democratic processes in uh, Latin America. And I'm speaking about Jose Miguel Insulza. Now we see what happens in this region, in the Latin American region, and we have to be accountable of it. We need to recognize that the OAS was uh, a very clever architect because it promoted this uh, Latin American democratization uh, fields and I need uh, to really praise uh, to the commitment made by Jose Miguel Insulza because uh, we need uh, to really vastly recognize and appreciate all of his efforts. It is also my pleasure to be here with Lorenzo Cordova at this forum and be able uh, to really see since we were colleagues at the university that he was uh, much younger than I and more talented than I. You can really make an oath on this uh, and I really thank uh, the opportunity <coughs> of being here with Magistrate uh, Ramos and see the active participation of the civil society <coughs> through the presence of Raul Avila. Well, the discussion of this uh, forum takes place at a moment uh, when we really question uh, democracy and economics. And uh, well, in a very optimistic uh, manner, we thought for a long period of time uh, that uh, all of these uh, copyrights are really good leaders, not only to an efficient result, but also to a result that would imply an improvement in distribution. We have been aware that uh, we really can really witness uh, the first one, but a good uh, definition of uh, copyright really led us to an efficient result in terms of that uh, nobody can improve proof uh, in this balance if he is not really impairing the other. But actually, after this definition, uh, we were able to see that some equality should uh, have been reached. And this has not been the case. Uh, equality is also one of the main concerns of economy. And as Lorenzo has said, uh, this has led to the rethinking of how to merge distribution mechanisms. And this is relevant because this is under the control of the state. And a good definition of a copyright and a good definition of the market, good, a good participation, and good to devise a public policies it can become efficient and more equitable, taking equity as one other factor that will allow us 
us uh, to make better use of our economies. We could make a similar analysis to democracy. This is the first division of democracy. And this would lead us to think about good registrations, as Manuel said, a uh, good uh, district process, a transparent one in terms uh, of uh, finance, uh, and uh, one of the transparent process uh, as uh, to the counting of uh, votes uh, could be really vibrant, whether it is true that all these elements help us uh, to be convinced that democracy will be the success of the one who gets the more votes. Uh, this is net guarantee that democracy will be represented and will also be an efficient mechanism in order to lead us to good results, uh, which eventually, as Jose Miguel said, is what matters society market as a democracy are just vehicles and not goals uh, per se. The topics discussed uh, at this uh, fifth forum on democracy has allowed us uh, to make a valuable analysis. First of all, the status quo of Latin American democracy. It is healthy. In our today's world uh, where conflicts have exacerbated, it is a value Latin America gives uh, to the world. A community, and uh, I should stress this, uh, has learned to solve uh, the conflicts it has, the ones that really split apart Latin America countries that will allow us to really preserve our borders, our limits, but it has also built spaces that are ruled by the state of law. And this has taken place for the very first time. And we have the status quo of a community among the Caribbean states, the Latin American states. And before the world, we are able to say we are a region that has challenges, but it's a democratic one and acts in peace in order to really ponder how all these results uh, will be represented with agents. Uh, we can say that it was not ambiguous. Now, how can we represent this democracy where we have social inequality? What can we do in order to allow democracy to give results before all these uh, challenges, poverty, and the challenges before gender equality. How do we have to adjust to democracy in order for it to have a better quality? And as Lorenzo said, the quality of the citizen, a citizen that more and more it has been endowed with more elements in order to have a richer quality. How should we endow our democracy before technological communication environment, which evolves on a daily basis? I feel proud myself because I use Facebook and Twitter. But uh, I have just told her, do you use uh, this uh, to media? She told me, oh, Dad, I'm sorry, but Facebook and uh, Twitter are not at the avant-garde. We are on Instagram. And now I have to humbly request my daughter, my 11-year-old daughter, to teach me how to use it. Uh, but uh, everything that was discussed uh, here will help, just uh, as it happens in the field of economics, uh, because in this way we will be able to have a better democracy, a fruitful one. Lorenzo said, when we tackled the topic of insecurity, I think that some um, points to ponder have been have uh, to be made by us. Uh, we are before the world, having constructed and generated conditions for a democracy which is proven to be fruitful in a concept uh, where in the continent, in the region, in the states, United States, uh, there were some reflections, discussions, analysis, challenges before democracies because, of course, uh, there was a lot of consensus. There was a uh, uh, splitting off. Uh, now here we have a consensus were in a political system where there is no majority, we were able to really make important consensus, transforming ones uh, that allowed us to bridge the gap, the historical ones, the modern ones, and be able to reflect them on the Congresses uh, in a democratic way with uh, 
dialogue because all of us are for important feel reflected in this consensus because we need to give the Mexican economy a better growth perspective that will push it forward and now as to insecurity which is not only unique to Mexico it is faced by countries who have a poor poverty who are in front of very many lack of definitions we need to really see how we're going to face them with transparency with the state with the rule of law being based on the international community precepts uh, in a very democratic transparent plural way before all this intolerance uh, and can we really give our best uh, face in a uh, government that does not allow us uh, not to do anything when a crime is committed to really face uh, all the challenges uh, regarding insecurity and also to say that uh, very many building blocks uh, have uh, been placed uh, because we need to persevere in this endeavor well just to, to wrap up uh, because i am the final speaker before lunch i would only like to express my deepest appreciation of being here of forming part of this panel and to formally declare closed the works of this uh, fifth forum on uh, international democracy. Let's give a big round of applause not only to this forum but also to Jose Miguel for all the efforts he has made. And uh, having uh, recognized uh, all his merit uh, on October the 10th, 2014, for the third time at Colmex, uh, I formally declared close uh, the works uh, of the fifth uh, forum of international, on international democracy. Thank you very much.